We're starting a new series today um, called Saturate. There's a group of churches around the Northwest and even around the world that are beginning to um, develop ministries and models to make sure that this whole region gets saturated with the knowledge of the glory of God. As see, we're saturated. Uh, we've already, we're already saturated. We've got um, all sorts of stories that go on, and we're caught in all sorts of wonderful stories. Some are not so good stories. Um, some are huge stories like the American dream. Others are you know, your own private story of brokenness and difficulty. But um, in order to just kind of frame this, I wanted to talk about kind of what grabs our attention these days. What is, the, what is it that, that grabs us? And, and I wanted to show some what I would call fascinating humans. All right, so behind me, just as we see, we, we see these videos all the time and we share them and we, I'm not sure how that one worked out actually. Um, but we look at this stuff and we say, I think I could do that. Or, or some of us say, no, I don't think I could do that. But, but some of you who are kinesthetic learners, your muscles are actually kind of firing right now going, what would it take to actually kind of do that sort of movement? And, and uh, it's easy, yeah. Because why not? Yeah. Nailed it, right? You know, our, our, we, can, we can kind of feel like, oh man, these, I think I could pull off some of this right here. I've tried this, wakeboarding. Um, I've tried to get off the water, basically off the water and then back on the water. Um, it was more off the water than in the water for me. But look at this woman. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, just all throughout. I mean, there's stories, stories, stories after stories about these fascinating humans. And we share them all day on social media, right? Look, look at this. It's so amazing. And we look at it and we're just thinking like, wow, I, I want to, I would like to be able to do that. I would like to be able to accomplish that. What they did is just brilliant. And I want to I want to kind of get in there with that. I want to, I want to be part of that. Uh, and, and you get, feel, get pulled in to kind of a gravitational pull almost like, whoa, I want, to be, I want to be like that person or I want to be able to do some of those things that that person does. And th- there's all sorts of ranges. There's, there's athletes um, like we, we just kind of looked at. You want, you want to think like them. You want your body to be able to move like them. Others of you are just happy to be sitting in a chair and I get that. Um, but, but, some of, but some of you are like, oh man, I, I remember trying this trick on my skateboard and I wish I could just get it to do this thing. Or I remember, I remember I was able to, you know, climb a tree once and I'd love to be able to, yesterday I was playing ultimate frisbee. I remembered way back when, when I used to be able to do that as I was trying to do that yesterday. Um, and my body was, was moving in, in different ways, but, uh, it hurts today. That's for sure. Um, but you, you, you think it, you're like, I could do that. Yeah, I, I could, that could, that could be me. That could be me. And we want to be fascinating humans. And actually, I, uh, don't, I don't want you to sound braggadocious or anything, but I know what it's like to be a fascinating human because I've impersonated them before. Okay? I've impersonated a fascinating human. It was just years ago. I'll never do it again. But I got to be Elvis Presley for, a, for an auction dinner. And, uh, wow, I've never been so nervous uh, as impersonating him. So, so there's that. But that was a put-on, right? That was just totally, totally put on. Yesterday, I was reminded that um, I look a lot like a professional football player named Kurt Warner. And, and, I've, and I've, had, I've had some of these experiences before where people have, have said, you know, do you know who you look a lot like? And so as I was playing with some new friends yesterday, they said, you look a lot like Kurt Warner. So I told them the story that, that once I was in the, uh, watching a Thunderbirds game, and a friend of mine... Uh, Brian used to be a youth pastor at a church, another church, and his youth group was at the same hockey game. And he was texting pictures of me and, um, and information to a kid across the arena. Hey, I'm sitting here with Kurt Warner. So he's hyping me up. It's pretty great. And, uh, and so he's nudging me. He's like, he wants to know if he can get an autograph. Is that cool? Is that cool? I'm like, yeah, totally. No problem. That's, that's fine. So I got, hopefully, I, hopefully I represented Kurt well in this moment. You know, the kid came up to me. He's like, oh, Kurt, Mr. Warner, can I get your autograph? Like, sure, I'll sign your T-Birds brochure, you know, or whatever your program. No, no problem. Yeah, I got this. So I signed it, and, and I couldn't remember how to, if Kurt had a K or a C at that time. But I think I just kind of worked it, you know, really fast. And then, 
I told the kid, you know, stay in school and believe in your dreams. And I, I hope, I hope I did. I hope Kurt wouldn't be mad at me for that, for that sort of thing. But, but you, let's get back off less, less about me. Um, but when we look at athletes or artisans or architects or, or we, we look at the scope of humans, there's just some pretty amazing stuff that they do. And it actually does draw us into it. Um, if you've ever watched Brit over there paint, um, and, and sometimes you can see it live because she'll do it in shows, but, but then sometimes she'll post some stuff of just the layers that have to go in for a portrait to come out. You know, you have to paint it one color and then paint over these other colors. It's fascinating really is. And just like, how does it, how does your mind, I don't understand how your mind works. That's amazing. How do you imagine those different, those different things? We see this, um, we see this all the time. Years ago uh, on a trip to Morocco, I was just astounded by, by the workmanship in, and this is in, uh, in Fez, the, the Medina city, the, the castle city of, of Morocco, the old capital. And just seeing, seeing the different, the work that they did. This was cedar that's lasted over a thousand years. Um, you know, just, just craftsmanship. I mean, it's obviously aged and, and old, but just pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. The mosaics and the, you get to go by the guys who are working on copper and, the, and just amazed. At how, do the, how does your mind conceive of these things? Again, how does your mind conceive of this as the best way to deliver portable propane tanks, right? That, that one didn't really impress me that much, but I was, I was a little scared actually walking by that, that one. Uh, that was not as impressive, I'll, I'll admit. But there, there's some things that, that humans do, and it's, and it's normal to be drawn in, just like, how does this work? To be really drawn into the brilliance of it, and then it's normal to want to share that. So we see that in social media all the time. How many of you, are, for the most part, you're on social media? Raise your hands. Um, yeah, most of you. So, you know, it's just to share this, share that. And it's not all about human brilliance. It's obviously also about cats, uh, oddly. Um, but let's just go with the, the human brilliance thing. It's normal to just say, oh, have you seen this guy? Did you see this woman? Do you know what they can do? Did you hear this story? This is amazing how they think. And, and it's normal to want to share those kind of stories. And it's, uh, it's, it's also... It's also normal to want to share in their brilliance. Like, hey, could you show me how to do that? Could you show me how to be better at that? Some of you have people in, in your field of interest or work or um, maybe, maybe it's because you want to be an athlete or maybe you want to be an artisan or, and, and you think, man, if I could just get some time with that person and get some of the tools of the trade, the tricks and the tips, you know, um, if, you're, if you're at Microsoft, you have some people that you're like, man, if I could get some time with that person, not just for your own, you know, um, career advancement, but to really hone the skill and figure those things out. We all have these people that are a bit ahead of us, and it's, it's pretty normal. Um, I, have, I am not a glass blower, and, nor the son of a glass blower, um, but I've been down to, to the Tacoma Art Museum and, and watched the, seen the work of, of Dale Chihuly, right? And I just think, I could do that, except for a few steps. Um, one of those steps would be skill and time and, and some of those things. But, but if, I could just, if I could just say, hey, Dale, um, I'm coming over tonight. Could you just show me around a little bit? Show me, show me how this works. So you don't know me, but I was kind of hoping to move in with you and learn your craft and really become as glorious as you are. Uh, what happens is humans are a little more stingy when you want to share in their brilliance, right? They, when you share in their glory, they're like, actually, that's kind of a me thing. And I'm not that interested in sharing my craft and sharing the, sharing the trade um, with you. It's really limited. I'm not coming over to your, um, you know, I'm not coming over to your house to just sit down and learn from you. That's, there's only a few people that get to do that, right? to share in their brilliance and to share their brilliance. Well, well, think about this. God himself, our creator God, has opened up this apprenticeship program for you not just to share his brilliance. Like, whoa, did you know what God does? Did you know what he can do? But to share in his brilliance, to have his glory worked through us as a people. 
And it's wide open. And the creator of the universe says, I want to do that in you and through you. Today it is Pentecost Sunday uh, in the church calendar. The, the, the moment where, where we stood, the people, people stood back and said, what is God doing? He's coming to indwell his people. The glory of God is now coming to dwell in his people in a new and magnificent, marvelous way. Um, so we're just going to look at that word glory. We're gonna, I use the word brilliance just to trick you for a minute. But really what, what it is, that there's something glorious about humans. And there's something even in, in a whole other category of glorious, the glorious nature of God. But this word, uh, you can try it with me. Um, uh, glory, or the, the Hebrew word is kavod. It's a BV kind of kavod, kavod. And this kavod, it, it, it literally means weight, like this weight. The implication is significance. So you see somebody and you say, whoa, look at that person is glorious. The way they, the way they live, the way they act. Or we'll see in one, signif- in one place the use of the word, um, they're just really large. They're very heavy, right? Well, look at that in 1 Samuel 4. You can go ahead if you want. But when Moses went to the mountain, we, we see this in Exodus 24, the cloud, this, the, the visible manifestation of God's glory was settling over this mountain. And the people said, we don't want to go there, but you can go, Moses, right? The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days, and on the seventh day, He called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in sight of the people of Israel. A devouring fire. That's how he showed up to Moses in the burning bush. And now this devouring fire. And the people said, you go, Moses. Yeah, you you do that for us. We're not sure we want to enter into have the glory of God be that close to us. But then we see that the glory of God was in the temple. And in in the furniture of the temple, we see the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the glory of God resided, in the tabernacle and then in the temple. Um, But we hear in in 1 Samuel 4.18, we get two uses of this word kavod, which I think you'd enjoy. You'll enjoy. Um, So Eli, this priest, hears that the Ark of the Covenant, the furniture piece that was in the Holy of Holies, the place where God's holiness radiated from that where that where that vision uh of isaiah was where where it was like god's presence is there and and all i can see is just a bit of his robe but the robe is filling in the temple with his glory it's just this beautiful manifestation god's presence among us yes the people of god the presence of god the purposes of god we're set this is who we are we're the this is what we're supposed to be and then eli hears that the ark of the covenant, which they took into battle, was captured. And he falls over in his chair and breaks his neck because he was old and very glorious. (laughs) His kavod was substantial. He's a big fat man, and he fell over in his chair. But the the word weight or significance is used in this term in in just his, that's a, it's a glorious human, right? That's glorious. But as soon as he mentioned it, he, he fell over, uh, his neck was broken, and he died. Um, for the old man was old and heavy, kavod. He had judged Israel 40 years. And then it says, Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth. For pains came upon her. We're not going to do a whole deal on, on labor right now. But, uh, says, but, but the woman attending her said, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she didn't answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ikavod. Ikavod. Because the glory has departed from Israel. The glory, Kavod, and this kid's name is going to be Ikavod, great name for, you know, oh, you're that kid, yeah. Um, the glory of God has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured. And just to reiterate, and because of her father-in-law and her husband, and she said, the glory 
has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. This kavod, right? This, the glory of God has been captured. Some of you know the story, how that was then brought back in later. The temple was filled with his glory. David was able to pile up the furnishings for the temple and then Solomon built the temple and God's presence dwelt among them again with fire and smoke. Uh, beautiful story. You've got you to get into it because it's, it's our story. But another way that the word was used, if you walked into David's house, you would say, this is David's kavod. Look at the artwork he's got up. Look at the shields and, and Solomon had even more just... Hundreds and hundreds of golden shields made. And all. you'd walk in, it's like, this is pretty glorious. The person who lives in this place has got a lot of kavod. He's got, this is, and, and, I, and I can see what he, what he honors. And, and some of you have a man cave. Some of you, many of you have your own bedrooms. Um, as a kid, I, I didn't have my own bedroom until later when my older brother moved out. And then I finally got to decorate it like I wanted and this is the late 80s, and so it was uh, Michael Jordan posters, basically. Um, Michael Jordan and Brian Bosworth, for those of you that were local at that time. Hey, that's no joke. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that you'd walk into my room and you'd go, okay, this is what Aaron's kavod is. Rather insignificant, but still. Uh, that was my that was kind of my thing, my style. And then, okay, there 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 it was. Um, but it's interesting. It, it, some of you uh, know this passage, um, but we're going to look at Psalm eight, and it'd be great if you go there with me. Uh, you can see on our if if you have the Faith Life Study Bible on the app or Logos Bible uh, Study Bible, you can just click on the link that's going to be offered to you if you follow our presentation. I never take enough time to explain those things, but. I'm preaching now. Give me a break. Okay, here we go. Psalm chapter 8. Or Psalm 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your kavod above the heavens, and out of the mouths of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. And when I look at your heavens, and, and uh, I was talking to a, a new friend here this morning, but just moved into Issaquah. When you just look around, it's like, wow, there's some glory here. This is a great place to be. And, and when I look at the heavens and I see your creation, I just see God's kavod all over. Like, look at this. It's so amazing. When I, when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Yet, you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with kavod and honor. That's humans. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He's a glorious God, and he wants to share his glory. He wants to share his brilliance with you. And so just as he has set up the earth and ordered it and, and made it uh, the way he wanted it to be, and, and he sends us on that same mission, um, he wants to share his glory with us. And, and just, like, just like we might, um, we, we might see his, his glory, the physical manifestation of God's significance in the, the work of his hands um, and in, in the spirit within us. He wants to offer that to us to show us how to become more like that. It's, it's like, Dale, hey, I'll, I'll come over for dinner and, and just hang out with you and learn from you. Um, in the sense that God wants to share that brilliance with you. He wants, he wants to make you, us, shine. And, and not just you individually. He wants to make a people that will reflect back to the watching world, this is what God is like. And so that, that our lives and our lips don't tell a lie about what God is like, but they tell more and more and more and more of the truth about what God is like. And the world is, is a wondering. The world's wondering, what in the world is God doing? What is God like? 
what kind of story is this that we have found ourselves in? And the church is supposed to be like, ooh, 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 choose me for this answer. I'll tell you what story we're in. I'll tell you who God is, and I'll tell you what he's up to in the world, and I'll tell you how you can participate with it, because he offers an apprenticeship for everybody to share in his brilliance, and then we can begin to share um, our, uh, the brilliance he gives us to reflect it to a world. So uh, let's dig in and see how this works. Are you with me? We're just going to spend a few minutes and just try to figure out how does this possibly work. So we have to go back to page one of the Bible. And, and, and in page one, we see that God, um, God has, has created and he has taken formless and void, tovu vavohu, this wilderness and waste, and he has formed it into habitable land. And he's created a garden and he puts humans in the garden and gives them a task. But first he gives them an identity. And what's that identity? They're the images of God weird because we don't know we don't we don't think in those terms but but the early audience that that would have heard this would have said oh i know what you're doing there because they had just come out of egypt where the pharaoh was the image of god god's representative on earth to enslave you basically but i'm but i i, I am the image of god says says pharaoh and so they're like wait he made humans that's the story we're in he made humans to image God, that we're not just, because there were stories all over the place. They're, they're not just, we're not just slaves here to serve the kings. We are all image bearers. Whoa, stand up straight. Let's go. We're all image bearers. And so he does this on, on you see it right at, right at the very beginning. He puts in Adam, whose name means human or man. And he gives us Eve, whose name means life. And he puts us, puts us in, our ancestors in the garden and says, now, Go out there and do what I've done and tame the wild, subdue creation and make some babies and make more image bearers who will do the same thing. And let's fill the world with the knowledge of the glory of God. Let's reign, let's let's rule on behalf of God. So he's the one who reigns and we rule on his behalf because that's that's our job. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So he says in, in Genesis 126, let's make man in our own image after our likeness and have dominion over the fish and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so to be made in the image of God means to represent him to creation. This is what a loving creator God wants to do in his world. And to each other, we represent um, God in that way. And so reflecting God, someone has said, we're like angled mirrors reflecting God to a watching world. That's, that's our job, is to reflect God's glory as a, as a people. Um, and so, so we, we're to glorify him. I, I remember as a kid, I was, uh, we had this piece of artwork that was kind of like wedding announcement slash dedication thing for my parents. And, and it was their verse that they had for their wedding and, which I wasn't there for, but um, but it was but it was the it was kind of the the request of husband and wife. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. Out of Psalm thirty-four, what a cool picture of like yeah, that's what we're gonna do. That's what our marriage is gonna mean is that we're gonna show a watching world what God is like. And magnify is not the sense of making something. <laughs> making something small bigger. It's just giving it its appropriate place, right? More like a telescope bringing in and, and, and drawing in. Oh my goodness, look at the glory of the heavens. Look at the glory of God. And that's what our lives are meant to be. I thought that was a really cool purpose statement for a wedding to pull that out. And so we're to display his glory. But what happens on page, I guess it would be page three of the Bible, right? We walked away from that task. We just said, we're going to take the knowledge of good and evil for ourselves. We'll determine what's right and wrong. Thank you very much. This will go well. We'll we'll just contextualize truth and it'll be what I think is right and what I think is wrong, what I think is good, what I think is evil, and we'll see how that goes. I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful experiment. Check back with you in a couple, you know, 
thousands and thousands of years, and we'll see how that turns out. But here we go. So we eat of the knowledge of, of, of good and evil, becoming like God in the way that we think we can now rule and reign on our own behalf. And we walk away from God, hiding in shame. And that's the human story. God doesn't leave it there. They were, they were made in his image. And I know that there's some debate over like what happened to the image of God in the garden. Was it just smushed flat? Was it destroyed? Was it marred? Was it like a statue that gets defaced and then it needs to be like clean, cleaned up to now reflect to a watching world? But if we just fast forward just a little bit to Genesis chapter 9, we see that, that he, gives, uh, he gives humans... Uh, oh yeah, he gives humans in chapter 9 verse 6 the, uh, the command that whoever sheds the blood of man, by, his, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. There's still something about who we are that's still supposed to reflect God to that, to that world. And so um, it, it really matters what story you think you're in and whose story you think you're in. Because if you think you're just in your story, then you're going to do things according to your own knowledge of good and evil. And you're going to do your things the way you think it's just supposed to work. But if, if we recognize whose story we're in, it makes, it makes all the difference. And as, as Christians, you, you realize this, I hope, <clears throat> that Christianity is not just a philosophy about how to get along and how to figure things out and how to make, make sense of, okay, a few things. It's, it's a claim that this is the way the world is. Do you realize that? It's a story, it's a story behind the story. It's the meta-narrative. It's, the, it's a claim that this is who God is, this is who we are. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This is how God enters our world. This is how we make sense of, sense of darkness and pain and evil. And this is how we make sense of hope and light of the future and who God is and what he's doing. And he, it's, it's the whole deal. So if you came because you thought Jesus was going to help you along in your story, just, just realize he, he may play along with that for a, a little bit, but, but you're being called into his story. And if, to have the way he thinks rub off on you. The other night at dinner, uh, I was just rolling around with these thoughts, and so I asked around the table, if you could choose any story that you've been reading or watching movies about or whatever, what story would you like to find yourself in and just be in, you know? And uh, we had a neighbor over, and so we'll put it on her. You know, she's like, Harry Potter. I'm like, yeah, that's the story I want to be in. I want to be in the wizarding world. Of, I want to be involved in, <clears throat> in all that. And, and then... You know, others, you know, kind of like superhero themes. And, and, and then and other, I was thinking, you know, Lord of the Rings kind of is a cool kind of narrative. I have, if I had to choose one other than Jesus, you know, which, of course, that's the right one. But um, if we had to choose another one, what would, it, what would it be? What captivates you about that story? And how do you find your place in that story? What, what heroes do you want to impersonate? Like Kurt Warner of the... Cardinals or something like that. You know, who do you, how, do you, how do you want to step in and find your place in the midst of that story? Well, the story is going on. And God is saying, I'll tell you whose story this is and how you find your place in it. And that's how we begin to reflect God's glory because we can tell um, the story about who he is. And, and uh, so what happened in humanity is we took the glory for ourselves and handed it to the enemies of our, enemy of our soul, the, personified as this kind of whispering snake in the garden, like, Shh, you can have whatever you want, just take and define good and evil for yourself, because then you'll be like God. And we say, oh, that sounds reasonable. Let's go with that. And ever since then, humans have been trapped, giving their, their autonomy over to the enemy. Do whatever you want. And we see how that's worked in human cultures and uh, sickening. The sickening, but um, we, we should know this, and I just need to put a stake in the ground on this. Um, we never stop worshiping. I know we called you to sing, and we called you to worship this morning, we called you to point, point to God, but you never stop worshiping. You just change who you worship. And if you don't have God as the architect of your story and the main character of your story, if you think like I've done for so many years, okay, what is God doing in my story? <laughs> Wait a minute. I think I'm the key figure, I'm the narrator, I'm the hero of this story. No, 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 no. 
I'm then now I'm focused on myself. And so if you can keep God as the hero and God as the architect and then find yourself in his story, you can begin worshiping him in a way that fills your whole life. Um, so idolatry is simply this, where we, we look to someone or something to tell us who we are other than God. And that can be looked to yourself. We talked about this last week with our, with our godly women conversation that sometimes we can look to our children to tell, say, tell me I'm amazing. Tell me I'm good. Tell me I'm, your, tell me I'm a great person. Tell me. And that's just the wrong kind of pursuit because children make terrible gods. How many of you are children in this room? Children, 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 children. We're all generally children because we had parents, but um, you make terrible gods. Spouses make terrible gods. Capricious. When, like what, what? I thought yesterday I, to please you and to gain my identity from you, all I had to do was these things. Yeah, well, it changed. Okay. All right. Well, now how do I, how do I get back to worship? I mean, I got to get, get I got to, you got to tell me who I am. And I'm, oh, I need you to tell me who I am. And that's all worship because that's who we are as humans. And we've got to draw our identity from him and from him alone. Okay. I think I had notes. That's right. So it starts, the story of God starts in the garden where God is, is, is he's, he's, he's there and he intends, uh, he intends everything to be ordered and to reflect who he is. You walk into his garden and that's his kavod. Wow, look at that ordered garden. That's a, that, I want to I worship a God like that. And then the, the, the story ends in this, garden but it's not just a garden it's a city so it's a city garden the new jerusalem coming to heaven where god makes his dwelling with us so we're kind of between two gardens right and which way are we going to point toward the rebellion or toward the recreation let's have our lives point in that direction let's have our sanctification process this brilliance shine more and more and more pointing toward the new stuff that god is doing not to the old so so in between god's the, the human rebellion and God's redemption, um, we, we, we see a whole story of Israel. But then as Jesus redeems and starts to recreate and makes all things new, starting with his resurrection, we start to lean forward toward that day when all things will become new. And we want to do things that will be done then, imperfectly now. But we say, will that be true? Or one way to say it is, is this already true in the future? Would I be treating my wife this way in the future? Would, would I be treating my coworkers this way if this was the real future that I'm leaning into? Because what's already true in the future is that all tongues, tribes, and nations are worshiping around the throne of God, and they've got it locked down. They know who their king is. And so we want to lean toward that day. So presently we live in the, the kingdom has come, but his will come. Jesus announces his kingdom. The kingdom is among you and the kingdom's going to come. And so we're in this in-between state. What in the world do we do? Well, that's where the apprenticeship starts, right? That's where we say, okay, this is what it looks like to live into this new reality that God's doing. And that's how he shares um, his brilliance in and through us. And so he's inaugurated his kingdom in the first coming. He's going to consummate it in his second coming. We're in what theologians call the already and not yet. Yes, Pentecost Sunday, the Spirit has come. We're ready to charge into the mission to take the, the, the message to be his witnesses for Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And I think we did that, didn't we? Because we're the ends of the earth. So wait, are you coming back? So it's not yet. It's not yet. And when that day comes, it's going to be glorious. And, and in fact, the the... The prophets looked forward to this day when it was going to come because the whole earth is filled with his glory, but not really the knowledge of his glory. Humans are the late adopters to this whole thing because we find ourselves in a different story. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How do the waters cover the sea? Any of you know? The water is the sea. <laughs> the waters cover the expanse of the sea. It, that's where that word saturation comes from. 
It just is. The, the knowledge of the glory of God will fill the earth in its abundance. And that's the task that we're leaning toward someday. The fish get it already. The trees get it. The rocks get it. The, the heavens declare the praises of God. But the humans, what's the deal? They don't know. They don't know. So what's our task? Well, our task is to, to witness to the kingdom of God to say, God's the king, Jesus is king, and he's back, and he wants to live in and through you, and he wants to order your life, and he wants to save you and, and, and take the sin away from you so that you can live in perfect connection to God someday. Because Jesus revealed that to us. He showed us what it would be like to be completely human and connected to God. And you're going to do that really imperfectly for a while. But someday... In your new creation, the new creation, you'll be able to do that. To be more human than you ever have been and connected to God in a way that we could only imagine now. But we can see it in the work and person of Jesus Christ. So there's a day. And what we're doing, what a group of churches around the Seattle area and way beyond, um, the people I were meeting with, you know, one guy was from Denmark and, and others from all over the United States and Canada and they have connections with people throughout all over, all over other places too, was that, that in this area, could there be a day coming soon where every man, woman, or child has a daily encounter with Jesus, who's the true glorious manifestation of God. They have an encounter with Jesus in word and deed, a daily encounter. Every man, woman, and child have a daily encounter. They can't get away from this Jesus guy. Everywhere I go, where I live, work, learn, and play, I'm finding people talking about Jesus. Like he's something special. Like, yeah, he is something special. We just only talk about it in here. He's super special. Like, we keep him in here. No, no, no. He's so amazing and so radiant that we need to take him out there. And so we're, we're imagining a day when, when every man, woman, and child has a daily encounter with Jesus, the true glory of God in word or deed, wherever they live, work, learn, and play. And so how is God going to bring this about? Well, we, we, we have an interesting context here on the east side. Uh, people are filled with all sorts of stories. They're saturated with all sorts of stories. They, they, they certainly don't give credit to God where credit is due, do they? Do you notice that? Do you notice the coffee shops abuzz with, man, I'm just praising God for what a glorious day this is. Did you see the stars last night? Isn't that amazing how God has fixed the heavens in this way? What do they do? They They may appreciate it, and I have lots of friends who appreciate the natural beauty. I just connect with God in nature, right? That sort of thing. I connect to the the force that's out there. I hug a tree, you know, whatever. But without, without having a a focus of our gratitude, it's not really gratitude. It's almost like self-congratulations. Isn't it amazing that we live in a place like this? That's cool. I like that. That's neat. But, but gratitude needs to have a focus. Thank you, God, creator of everything, for your majestic nature and how you love us and want to draw us into what you're doing. Thank you, God. And you notice that it's not happening, right? We're, we're, the topics of conversation don't just trend toward our glorious creator who's majestic and loves us enough to indwell us and lean, lean into us. It's not happening. Is it? Am I wrong? Do you hear it happening much? We, 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 need, we, we need to be a part of that and uh, that process because that's That's glorious. So what? If you, if you had tomorrow, you woke up and your Twitter feed or your social media account had 7 billion followers, and you're like, whoa, okay, I'm finally in the position where I'm supposed to be. Okay, here we go. Let's order society. Uh, first things first, da, 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 boom, and the world's like, okay, yeah, that's the way it goes, right? Would we be better off or worse off? Yeah, and you're like, whoa, we're headed down his direction now. The only one who's worthy of that kind of attention, that kind of focus, is our, is our Heavenly Father. And when, when He gets that focus, everything comes into order. And so let's be a people that bring that focus about His heavenly order and, 
and be about bringing his, his kingdom in that way. And so the, the word of God, we, we sang this, everything is under his feet. Everything is under his feet. But if we are Christ's body, where is everything? Under, under our feet. He is the head and we are his body and he's given us this whole terrain. Like, go. No, we'll, st- we'll stay. No, no, no. Uh, wait for the Holy Spirit and then go. Everything is under your feet. Go out into a world. He, he put everything under Jesus' feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Go spread that. And what we don't know is how to do that. And we don't know what that's looking like. So, so I'm going to give a hint at it today. And then over the next weeks, we're just going to talk about how could we organize around the central nature of giving God glory that he's due in, in this whole area and every, everywhere we go. Um, Colossians 1.27 to says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So where does this glorious transformation have to start? In you. In us. In you, the Colossian church, in us, the Issaquanian church. What is that? It's the, the church in Issaquah. We'll just call it that. It needs to start in you. It needs to, it, the transformation has to start in us so that our lives begin to wake up into a new story. So that we start to be thinking about his glory instead of our own story that we get stuck in. And then, I mean, that's the Christian life. Just trying to say it in different ways. But it's not the way that many of you grew up in your Christian life, maybe. Or maybe it is, and we've forgotten about it too. But this is what we're being called to. If the knowledge of the glory of the Lord filling the earth happens, it's going to happen because it, it went through us first. And, and our hope is not in how well we can manufacture the life of Christ for them. Our hope is in an actual person, Jesus, who's going to do this work in and through us. So does it require you stepping out in faith? Absolutely. Does it require you to be a little more bold than you've been? Absolutely. Does it mean you need to spend some time asking Jesus, just prepare my path, prepare my steps? Yes, yes, yes. But the power, the mystery, the hope is Christ in you to do this thing. Okay, so, so gospel saturation, you'll hear this word over and over and over, gospel saturation, where, where there would be a daily encounter throughout this region in, in word and deed where people encounter Jesus has got to happen in us before it happens through us. It's got it's to happen in you before it happens through you. You're going to talk about what you're going to talk about. You're going to be fascinated by what you're going to be fascinated by. You're going to have a story running in your head and you're going to try to put all the parts of the world and your experiences into that story and you're going to share that with people. You're going to write a book. You're going to do some art. You're going to do your job. You're going to, but it all fits in some story. And if the gospel can have its work in you, then you begin to see how this fits and this fits and this fits. And then you have a gospel language to use. And then when your pastor says, hey, you got to be sharing your faith, what he really means is, tell people about the story that you're being transformed in. Tell people about what God's doing in and through your life. Tell them about the majestic nature that, that God has created. Just start talking about what you're fascinated by. And we all do that day in and day out. So the master has offered an apprenticeship. Okay, he's offered it. Are you in? Do you want to share in his brilliance? Do you want to share his, his glory? Do you want to share in his glory? You, you, if you're in, then I say that's what we've, as a church, have got to be about. If we want to use terms like apprentice just to, make, to remove discipleship, because what does that even mean? Let's just think about it. That, that what we're to do is to make apprentices of Jesus in the everyday stuff of life. Wherever you live, work, learn, and play, we just start to think, hey, how do we then reflect glory, God's glory to a watching world who says God is like a pony, or God is like a force, or God is like a this, or God is like, no, 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 no. God is who he is, and let's, let's reveal him accurately to a watching world. So it's got to happen. Um, through us. Master craftsmen are needed. 
and the apprenticeship has begun. Um, Jesus is, is restoring all things, making all things new, and he needs his master craftsmen to put together this, this workmanship that he's created us in Christ Jesus to be. Um, so the end of the story, I, I don't know if you read there much, um, it's probably the most graspable part of the book of Revelation is in the end where it all comes down and the heaven, heavens and earth together, God has recreated the new heavens and the new earth and, we, and he reigns among us. And it says we will rule and reign with him. So in this apprenticeship, we're also learning to rule and reign on his behalf with his knowledge of good and evil, with how he says things ought to be. And so we are training to reign. Okay. So in the weeks to come, we're going to explore how we can position ourselves as, in a, as a church, as apprentices of Jesus, so that we can be his master craftsman someday and we can begin to can do that. But these are the things I need you to, to be thinking about together. And you can write these down. Um, we're praying right now, 100 churches praying for 100 days throughout this region, asking God to just do some, some amazing things. But, but do this. Ask God to transform your affections. Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm not fascinated by you. I'll just tell the truth. I'm not fascinated by your story. What is wrong with me? How can they present the gospel and I can just sit there and go, eh, oh yeah, that's right. I think that's, well, I'm not sure that's completely right because didn't, didn't Jesus do this first or whatever? Because, change my affections, Jesus. Transform my affections. To, maybe that polishes up the reflection a little bit. But just change my affections, transform me. I want to display your glory in increasing ways to a watching world. Right. And then ask God to help identify people near you. Neighborhood, work, school, the gym, where, wherever you are, live, work, learn, or play, that need to learn from Jesus. Because you're one of them. So who are some other ones? And I'm going to be asking you over the, over the weeks to begin to just dial in. Okay, yeah, there's a few people in my in my in my office area that are trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. I'm going to meet with them every week and we're just going to start figuring this out. Um, we're, we've, got, we've got resources and, and stuff for it and we're going to call these groups what other people have called them DNA groups to really get the core of this apprenticeship down. Discover, nurture, and act. To discover what God's doing, to study his word and figure out who he is, to share our stories together, to nurture the growth and then to put it into action. That's where we take, take it to the streets. We get outside. And then we're hoping to see in, in each local community a, a, a group of these DNA groups gathered together saying, what are we going to do together? Because this is our region where we live, work, learn, or play to show the world what God is like. Okay? Just, just to put it in a real practical terms moving forward. And I want to encourage you uh, in, in that. We don't reflect Jesus alone. We are the body of Christ. We're his family. That's another picture. And we do this together. I'm not the full picture. <laughs> Believe me. I mean, you already know this. But I'm not the full picture. I'm not the body of Christ. I'm not, I don't reflect to the watching world. This is exactly what, no, no, not, a, not even close. But we together do that. Different gifts, different graces, different ways that you participate. The, 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 your unique DNA and spiritual DNA, that's how it happens. Okay? Uh, so as we... Uh, as we move to a time of communion right now, and I want to ask that um, the servers can prepare for that. Um, I, want to, I want to read this to you. It's Psalm chapter 34, the 34th Psalm. And, and it's the psalm that my parents used as like their key, let's do this together. Let's magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I want to read that for you and then I want to, I want to pray. We're going to pass the communion elements. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth because my fascination with him continues. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those to, who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. 
The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. This is called Christian church. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer and want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. As we, as we step into this moment where Jesus doesn't just give us a direction, he gives us a meal to remember him, to experience him by taste and see that the Lord is good. Change my affections, God. Help me, help me be about you. Help me have my story be just about sharing your brilliance and and, and you radiate off of me. The, the people of God are radiant because, of the, because we've tasted and seen how good God is. As we step into communion, I um, will encourage you to, to just ponder that for a bit. That Jesus has done this work in your life. And I'll explain those details and then, then we'll take it. Let me close in prayer. Jesus, we confess that we're not about your glory. We're not about spreading the news of of your gracious kingship as much as we ought, as the redeemed people of God. And so transform us. Just change our affections. Start here. Start now with this this meal that we're about to partake in. Small though it is, very meaningful. God, help us identify those who want to, to pursue you, Jesus. We love you. You're gracious to us. You're kind to us. And we ask that you would be honored in this moment.